Once again, we have the privilege of looking at the glorious names that God has given to himself. 25 weeks so far. Some think that's way too long. Some think it's amazing we've been there that long. And some think, well, I hope we have a lot more to go. I don't know which category you fall into, but someday you will hear in heaven, if you are a believer, those names of God expounded by our Lord Jesus Christ himself, the one who bears those glorious names. For it's at the name of Jesus that every knee shall bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This past week, as you know, I was up in Massachusetts for four days at the meeting of the Dean Bergen Society, their annual meeting at which various members present papers on different aspects of the text of the Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic scriptures that underlie the King James Version of the Bible. I had the privilege of speaking on Islam in the King James Bible, and most people think that that is a non sequitur. Uh, they say, how in the world does Islam have anything to do with the King James Version? Those are folks who don't know the history of Islam. Those are folks who don't know the history of Muhammad and how during his time of persecution, he fled to a place called Aksum, ancient Abyssinia, modern day Ethiopia, and actually lived in a place where the scriptures were very powerful and where there are still the remains of ancient churches that were there during the days of Muhammad. If you weren't listening in to that message and the way in which the text has been corrupted and the way in which modern day translations are being corrupted as various translators use a defective text among Muslims, you need to listen to that message. It will soon be up on the uh, Dean Bergen Society website. I encourage you to go there and to listen to it so that you will understand what a treasure it is that God has given to us when he gave us his word. But in that message, we spoke about one of the perversions of the names of God. And there's an argument between Arab Christians and other Arab Christians, some of whom use the name Allah, which is the Muslim designation for God, and others who refuse to use it because they claim it traces back to a moon god who was in the Kaaba in Mecca prior to Muhammad destroying all of the idols in that place. But that misses one of the great points, which is what our study has been about, which is the names of God as given in Scripture. And the passage that we read this morning in Exodus 3, 13 through 15, God gives his name, I am that I am. It is the root form for the name Yahweh or Jehovah, or as you see in your Bibles, L-O-R-D in all capital letters, whenever that name occurs. And God says, that is my name forever, and that is my memorial unto all generations. That is a name that is excluded from the Quran. The Quran lists, as do other Muslim writings, 99 different glorious names of God, but this one is excluded. And when you read some of the other names that are listed as the glorious names of God in Muslim writings, you should become uncomfortable as you see that some of those belong specifically to Jesus Christ. I'm not going to preach that sermon here. But we need to understand that God has given us his names in the scripture. And as he reveals himself through his names, we learn more about the character and the person of the one who is our God. The one who is, in fact, our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom someday we will give an account. And so we have been looking at Psalm 23, where the Lord is my shepherd. 
Jehovah the shepherd, the one who cares for his flock, who takes care of his own. Last week, on the 21st, we reached the second half of verse 5. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. The whole verse in its context says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord, that's Yahweh, Jehovah, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, forever. And we saw that that's what happens when the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, as the psalmist says, my cup runneth over. That's what happens when we drink the cup of salvation, when we come to Christ and call upon him, the one who is the Lord. His cup is infinitely large in its provision. Psalm 116, 13, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. We noted that we probably had in our mind when we read that phrase before, a cup that we hold in our hand to drink. But as we pointed out, look at this cup in the context of the psalm. It's sheep who are grazing by still waters, and that's the context of my cup runneth over. The source of the water is not running river that could sweep the sheep away. The source of the water is not a stagnant pool with pond scum on it. The source of the water is not an evaporating, shrinking body of water that was left by the last rain, but that will very soon soak into the ground. The cup of water here, as it's described, and as Jesus describes it in the Gospels, is an underground spring at the bottom of the pool that keeps replenishing the pond with fresh, cool water over and over, no matter how many sheep drink, no matter how much evaporates, no matter how much is used for other purposes. The water keeps filling the pool to the brim until it runs over. We talked about the many different kinds of cups in Scripture. And then we talked about the picture of a cup in Scripture that applies to our text here and that relates to us personally. The people of God are pictured as a cup, a vessel that holds something precious and life-giving. We saw the Lord Jesus applying that to Saul, who was to become the Apostle Paul. Speaking to Ananias, the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel. Did you know God chooses cups off the shelf? You may be a cup that he chooses. What kind of a cup are you? Because we're told what the chosen vessels do. He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name. This series has been on the names of God. In this we have seen all the different ways in which God describes himself by name. And if you are saved, you are a chosen vessel to bear his name. You are to reflect what he is like. You are to manifest forth to others what he is like. You are to be a cup that runs over, not a cup that is held well inside with a lid on it so nobody ever knows what's in you. To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. God makes different kinds of cups. Romans 9. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the slain lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. If you're saved, you are made a vessel unto honor. How should you treat the cup that God has given you? That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. 1 Thessalonians 4, 4. My cup runneth over. What does your cup contain? What is running out of your cup that other people see? and taste, and unfortunately in some cases smell. You see, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we need to keep that temple clean and pure. That's your cup. 
It's called a temple. Ye are the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And then down three chapters later in 1 Corinthians 6, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? You are a cup that is owned by someone. A cup that is taken off the shelf and filled. A cup that is designed to bear something that is valuable. A cup that reflects what spills out from inside and other people sense about you. A cup that runs over. Oh, how many passages we looked at last week. We'll not go over them all, but I give you just one in remembrance. 2 Timothy 2.21 if a man therefore purge himself from these, and he has just listed various sins, if a man therefore purge himself, that is, clean himself out, get rid of all that rubbish that we so much like to cling to, that we let stick to the inside of our cups. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. God uses clean vessels. So keep yourself pure. We saw the cup also reminds us of the Lord's table, and we spoke of those passages there. And now we move forward today. The last thing we spoke of last time, foreshadowing what we're looking at today, is our cup is supposed to be a blessing for others. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only, in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. And so now perhaps you have a better understanding of that phrase, my cup runneth over. What we've learned from scripture concerning the overwhelming, rich, abundant way God portrays his cup is that it's a cup that never runs dry. It's like an artesian spring that constantly replenishes with fresh, cool, living waters. It is the cup of salvation. It is the cup that has brim-flooding water of the Holy Spirit for those who place their faith in Christ. It's a cup that holds the indwelling Spirit of God inside. It is a cup that must be kept pure and clean for the Master's use and it is a cup where the waters are offered freely and eternally. Here's how David expresses it in the Psalms. Psalm 42, 2. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Do you feel like you're dry sometimes? Do you feel like when you pray the heavens are as brass? Does it sometimes feel like you've just run out of steam? It's time to go back to the source of refreshment. Quit walking in the flesh. Quit trying to accomplish the Christian life by keeping the law. Quit trying to accomplish the Christian life by working hard at it. The refreshing coolness is there. Your soul thirsts for the living God. And he will fill you. Psalm 143.6, I stretch forth my hands unto thee, my soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. Selah, do you desire God that way? Or do you just sort of putter through life, stumble through each day, haphazardly doing whatever happens to happen next? Or do you have an earnest thirst, an earnest desire for God's life-quenching Holy Spirit to refresh you. Do you know where he refreshes you? He refreshes you in his word. How much time are you spending in the word of God? Not just reading it so you can get the proper number of chapters so that you can get the certificate at the end of the year, which we always pass out, to everybody who has read the Bible through in a year. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is where you sit down and you so much enjoy the scriptures that you can hardly stop. 
where you're seeing things in the text that you never saw before. Now, folks, I don't know how many times I've read through the Bible. Over and over and over and over. I've worn out so many Bibles, I can't count them. And in every one of my Bibles, I write in the margin. And I mark in red and green and yellow and orange and many other different colors. And I write notes in the margin. And just yesterday, I was reading through Zechariah. And I saw some things I had never seen in that book before, even though I've read it many, many times and studied it carefully because it's an important prophetic book. And it was so exciting to me to see some things that suddenly rang bells about being a cross-reference to some other passages. Not something that the editor had put in the text, but something the Lord brought to my mind because I'd been studying in the New Testament as well. I read out of the Old Testament and out of the New Testament every day and try to study the passages in depth. And so as I repeat the New Testament, I'm still in the Old Testament at a different spot, and so I keep overlapping with different passages of Scripture as I read through those two. And God brings them together and begins to show things that are marvelous in his word, and I have a hunger and a thirst because I want to know the living God. Dear people, do you thirst for the living God? If not, there's something wrong. If you have no thirst in your soul as did David for the living God, and you want to know his word to quench that thirst, there is something wrong with your vessel. You've got something in it that doesn't belong there. Isaiah 55, 1. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. God gives it to us at no charge. He's paid the full price with the blood of his son. So back now to Psalm 23. Psalm 23 portrays Jesus as the shepherd. We see that very clearly. But you know, it's fascinating as we study scripture because Jesus, who is Jehovah, is not only the shepherd, he is also the Lamb of God. And we're told in scripture that he is the Lamb that leads the other little lambs to drink of the living water to drink of that cup that gives eternal refreshment. Listen to how he's portrayed in Revelation 7, verses 16 and 17. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of water and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Dear friends, are there tears in your eyes? Are there tears in your heart? The one who is the shepherd who gives his life for the sheep is also the sacrificial lamb of God. And he is the one, the lamb, it says, is the one who leads them to the fountains of living waters. He leads his sheep to the fountains of living waters. Psalm 36, 9, For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. It's a call to you. Come to Jesus and he will give you rest. Come to Jesus, he will satisfy your soul. 
Come to Jesus, he will stop the hunger pangs that you feel. Come to Jesus, he will give you the eternal living waters in the cup of salvation that overflows. Come to Jesus and to the cup that will never run dry. Oh, dear friend, if you don't know Jesus, come to him today. He will in no wise cast you out. That is his promise. Jesus, of course, applies that name of God to himself. His name means Jehovah is salvation. He calls himself the Good Shepherd. Look how John chapter 10 parallels in all 14 points that we've seen how it parallels Psalm 23. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name. You are not part of an indiscriminate group of dirty old sheep out there somewhere. I've seen some huge herds of sheep when I lived in the West and in the Midwest. Huge herds. And I'm pretty sure that most of those goat ropers, as they would call them, out there are not real acquainted with every one of the sheep in those flocks. He calls his own sheep by name. You are personally known to Jesus and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. That's an important phrase right there, the sheep follow him. Shepherd is leading, sheep are following. It's important for several reasons. Number one, it means the sheep should not be going ahead of the shepherd. The shepherd doesn't have to drive his sheep. The sheep follow him. Shepherd goes first, sheep follow. But Psalm 23 tells us something else about following. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you are following Jesus, something else is following you goodness and mercy. The minute you quit following the shepherd, you know what's following you? Goodness and mercy. How important every part of the text is, how important every part of the Christian life is, how important it is to make sure we are actually following the shepherd. But a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. How often we don't have the foggiest clue because we're not spiritually in touch. Dear people, that's why it's important to walk by faith. That's why it's important to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Otherwise, as with the disciples here, they did not understand what he was talking about. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Entering in by Jesus means being saved. That's the illustration that he's giving of salvation and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. And then suddenly he switches the picture. At first he was the door. Now he says, I am the good shepherd. 
the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. And then he says it again, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. He's telling them what's going to happen in the book of Acts. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. There's going to be one fold and one shepherd, no distinction between Jew and Gentile in the body of Christ. That's what we see happening if you've been with us on Sunday evenings going through the book of Acts. And we're just at the end of Acts chapter 10, beginning of Acts chapter 11, where the Gentiles have been brought into that one fold in Christ. Here's Jesus, John chapter 10, telling them that it's going to happen. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Jesus wasn't the victim of circumstances. Jesus laid down his life, and Jesus as God had the intrinsic power of the resurrection to rise from the dead according to the scriptures. And that's the good news of the gospel. Romans 1, 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the one who is our good shepherd. A shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep but a shepherd who rose from the dead, proving he's conquered death and Satan and the world and the flesh and all the demonic hosts. And he will bring us safely to his home. You see why the names of God are so important? Because when Jesus applies them, he applies them to himself and he applies them to what he did at Calvary. This commandment have I received of my Father. And so what has he done and is he doing now because he is the shepherd that ties us in with Psalm 23? He tells us in John 14, a passage you've heard many times at funerals. John 14, 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. What's the last phrase of the psalm said? And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus is not just making things up as he goes along. Jesus is specifically tying himself back to the promises that are associated with the names of God in the Old Testament. We see that particularly in the Gospel of John, where in John chapter 8, Jesus claims to be the I am. He says before Abraham was, I am. That takes them back also to Moses because that's the name God gave to himself at the burning bush. And they took up stones to stone him. Jesus very pointedly all through the Gospels is claiming the names of God for himself. And he demonstrates that with power by the resurrection from the dead. 
That's the one who is your shepherd. That's the one who takes care of you. Is there anything that we need to fear when we have a shepherd such as that? One application we need to make on this, and here's where you can hold my feet to the fire and your elders. We have a very weighty responsibility, an awesome responsibility of reflecting the character of Christ, the chief shepherd, and the responsibility as under-shepherds in caring for the flock. Hebrews 13, 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Peter picks up 1 Peter 2.21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls." The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory which shall be revealed, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. You see all the shepherd sheep picture that's being given? And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. If you serve as a shepherd, you'd better make sure that you were appointed by God and not just appointed by man. God says he's the one that appoints the shepherds, Jeremiah 23, 4. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. I'd wanted to talk about the curse that God places on bad shepherds and then how Jehovah protects his flock from bad shepherds, but our time is up and we'll leave that for next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ is the good shepherd and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Where instead of just being the door, he's the shepherd. And where instead of just being the shepherd... He becomes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who suffers and dies on the cross. The Lamb that sheds his blood for the remission of sins. The Lamb who is not only slain, but the Lamb who, as we see him in Revelation, is a Lamb that is standing as though it had been slain, but is standing, it's the resurrected Christ. And he will feed his own little lambs and his own sheep so that they no longer hunger. And he is the lamb who will lead his flock beside the still waters, that is, into the fountain of everlasting waters as portrayed for us in that beautiful revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto his servant John to show the things that must shortly come to pass. Gracious Father, how beautiful and how infinite is your word. And how life-giving it is. And how it quenches our thirst and how we yearn for the living God. Our soul thirsteth after thee, O Lord. Quench our thirst by the water 
of the word. For we pray it in Jesus' name, the one who is the word of God. Amen. Our closing hymn for this morning is hymn.